flowers were in fact hello changes of the texture whenever the first few were just dressing call it interpretation <laughs> intuitive, perhaps wrong, solution of playing the second repeat of the arpeggio in each bar that Bach organized for the pacing should be different, less, or more. So it becomes a little bit of a vain game of outfitting um, the essence of the harmonic progression played in chorale of the first prelude, of course, of the World Temperate, played here by Bach. Or is it really by Bach? Or is it mostly by all the copyists who copied it after Bach till today? It's sort of a written novel transition tradition. I think the patterns were not as determining as the structure. Of course, that's why the harmonic progression is the one that matters. But then the dressing is part of the charm too, and uh, the seduction of the peacefulness of it. If he's only repeating it directly into the next harmony without to repeat what I meant. Instead of repeating it, to settle in as if to... to insist on the stability of the tonal system and um, not using it as an echo, just as a continuous statement, which in the Baroque tradition of what we think is uh, the performance practice could have been either decorated differently or ornamented. Which is so minute difference, but of course today is blasphemous since we uh, recite the score, but in those days they copied the score that they would study and perhaps sometimes willingly or not, most likely both perhaps. Anyway, they re redressed it into their own customization and then we receive it after all this for what it is rather than for what it looks. We being the recipients of all these uh, traditions um, of the copies, students, teachers becoming students who teach, etc. And this chain of transmission, we receive it more or less adulterated or poor text, original to the text as we think the handwriting is, even if not attributed really to the composer. What is the only thing attributed to the composer, in fact, is the thought process, the emotional mood that we perceive from what the composer perhaps did or did not foresee within his or her time or even beyond <coughs> the uh, chronology of events. So it's in a way, while I play the prelude today here for you, um, it's already been done so many centuries ago. So am I just reproducing something or is it in the present because it is me playing it for you today? So it's not mine, except that I appropriate it for myself while I play it. So it's my responsibility how I'm going to pedal it, to harmonize it for the resonances of my instrument, which I think are more seductive to your ears. But perhaps some ears will find that appallingly heavy. They would like to hear just the arpeggiation melodically of the third, fifth, and the root, rather than to hear it with held sounds, which harp organ style suggests more the choral harmonic progression rather than the melodic display of the arpeggiation. And in the notation, Bach himself, or as far as we think it was Bach himself who wrote these details, if we believe in all this authenticity of the texts, harpsichord-like 
bleeding, as they call it, when you stay over your, your uh, welcome to obtain a legato, you could stay over stay, um, over stay, <laughs> fact. Uh, and here the half note and the third um, eighth note slurred. I meant to be held. Perhaps on the harpsichord they were, but not till the end of that second and fourth beat. I rather had this kind of gesture from the root to the tenth, with a slight evaporation of the resonance until the next we start according to the acoustic, of course, just like in the first um, cello suite. He uses the empty strings as a resonator. And the design is here with a neighboring tone. Here it's not. At least it wasn't that day. It could have, but this is the endless option of customization. In fact, the more we uh, think, or if we do, uh, to creatively redecorate it, the more we transform the attention, we transpose, or even yeah, move away the in attention from the melodic bass with the harmonic progression. either through articulation, either through redecoration, we will distract the attention from the main point of the chorale, which is, uh, well, the prelude chorale. <laughs> that was a nice uh, slip. Um, because it means both uh, to establish, therefore, the tonality, which is the whole point for the prelude, in order to have the fugue Prelude, of course, is to establish a tonality, which of course I could do by and then start the fugue as um, brutally short as it is. It establishes the tonic, the subdominant, the dominant, leading tone, tonic. But he elaborates it on two, five, one, into the G major tonality, which in fact is only to the dominant key. So the purpose of it was perhaps to be creative in the um, Baroque time period understanding of the word, which was that you take the score as a canvas and then you blossom it with your own taste, good or bad, according to the opinions of each other. But today the teaching is not based on create your own decoration is of course based on recite the correct edition and within the recitation which is not by any stretch of the imagination um, limitation only after all these notes are beautiful for what they are and we don't need to search above and around them to express what it means to us or to what we think it meant to him or to the students and scholars and performers who since the composition of this piece have played it, practiced it, or used it for their um, different keyboard digital necessities. And remain focused on the meaning of this display of harmonic progression. So, to a certain extent, we can say that each prelude can be dressed or interpretation um, customized, like to be more or closer to what we think that the mood of the character of both of the piece represent. Obviously, if the second prelude was in C major, because it's in C minor, because it's in sixteenth notes. 
like at the same time tragic or dark because we associate the minor to something dramatic, pathetic, like patetico, uh, the, the Greek sense of the word, um, like in the Beethoven sonata or fate. Uh, so it's difficult to play. But why not, after all, no more than. Or, in other words, there is no correlation, 100%. Uh, locking the truth from some wrongness of the idea that oh, it's wrong to play it too slow because it's in 16th notes. Per se, there are not mood pieces either in terms of their necessity since those preludes are there for harmonic purpose. This, in this case, 1, 4, 5, 1 to establish the tonality of C minor. Like one, two, five, one to establish C major. So, by the notation, by the suggestion that these are sixteenth notes, therefore they're grouped in a way through sixteen in a bar that gives us this impression of organized order of many notes. <laughs> intuitively the reader, the performer, even having eventually, which is very rare, not heard it ever before, besides then comes the aesthetic idea of the tempo according to the technical approach of it, because then it becomes an etude for articulation of quick notes. But I think it's a combination of the fact that we think of these pieces, of course, as their function was to write a prelude and a fugue in each tonality, because of the tuning allowing for the unison to play in keys which on the harpsichord earlier days people didn't play at because it was out of tune sounding because it was tuned specifically only for certain keys in which the thirds were really blossomed and um, so that is the purpose but the purpose doesn't make it for a meaning and while you still say oh, can I play a pretty different thing in C minor then I could do <laughs> make a variation of it. So you could have written the 24 preludes with the same pattern, just different key, with slight decorative changes. Obviously he is much more creative than this, but he wrote it down, unlike most Baroque musicians before him, who didn't want to impose on the performer, composer performer, as most of them, if not all of them were then, since the education was not separating the two music-making uh, ways to uh, not impose a pattern and that here in a more didactical, pedagogical way Bach, at least through the manuscripts we have gives us a fact that we don't have to play anything but what he wrote even if we can extrapolate the harmonic progression and then imagine to play um, harmonically because we've observed correctly the harmonic progression so we've understood the skeleton so we know the GPS we know where the piece goes and which degrees is going to visit in order to create the signature of C minor to prepare for the view the prelude in terms of its musical meaning but the prelude is there to prepare for the fugue as I like to say it's a centerpiece but the prelude itself then uh, indulges more in um, expressions of which we hear in arias in cantatas of his own compositions which are not written as keyboard exercises or meant to be as such so if, for instance C sharp major the third one <laughs> short values, 16th notes in short bars of 3-8, but when you hear it, you think 12-8. 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 1, 2, 3, 4. The pace 
spacing of the groups of 4, 8, 16 um, obliged the sense of um, uh, not only symmetry but also um, expectation of organization. <laughs> If you reduce it to this, then it sounds like G major. He didn't do it. There is uh, endless perversions we can get into. Say, ah, I like the prelude in C sharp major, but with the pattern of the G major. Uh, well, yeah, why not? In absolute terms, then anything is in anything, and everywhere is in anywhere. But we have a score, after all, for as much as we can authenticate it. And that point is not museum-like authentication. Oh my God, is that an original uh, Vermeer or is it a copy? But if we love it, it, we might love it through the copy still. And perhaps, of course, the very <sighs> admiration that we have for Bach is not so much in the interpretation, I assume, since we don't know how it was really played. It's more in the thought process of his organization of thoughts, therefore. Also, in the preludes, adding a sense of character that uh, the fugue is supposed to be more impartial. Though the fugues also have the character if they are vocal, um, with long values like C sharp minor. Or short sixteenth notes like in that C sharp major. myself biased by the fact that it's in major. What if it was the C sharp minor fugue? I wouldn't so easily stack out of the jump of the six in the C sharp major original if it was minor because I would associate it for good or bad, probably wrongly, to something more emotional, perhaps more sad. Uh, inject into it my expression over its own expression and my assumption over its proposition which cannot be neutral because obviously it has some kind of connection between the key in terms of its mode major or minor with the lips so you do it emphasize it more or you subphrase it in bowing system of, 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 of phrasing with group by two or by syncopation which almost then creates a suspension that doesn't exist at least not notated as such but it becomes then a different um, not only reading but suggesting a different character than it has at least if it was in minor is so generic that it, it's paradoxic that it functions even if it's wrong because it's not the proposal on the score the proposition is different but I don't think we can consider it as a betrayal because in a way if you play the marching uh, the funeral march in major in Chopin sonata you make a statement of something that is provocative <laughs> But that's because it's program music by itself. Already, the slow steps of the procession, avoiding the leading tone, and mournful and repetitive, and not fast, because of the sense of funeral respect or mourning for the loss of the dead person. But in Obviously, that is a factual mis provocative misunderstanding if you play it in the wrong pace or mode. Whenever in Bach, if I do fourth prelude in C sharp minor, it's written in six four with eighth notes and it's 
so displayed on the score that when I look at the music, I cannot think of... but then it becomes in other words the problem is to find boundaries within the creativity without which then it's anarchy and um, the organization of the score with the group of bars and the organization of the display of the elements regardless if the details or we could think of them but perhaps not everybody does of the different um, design of the um, different uh, decorations are less meaningful than the structural harmonic progression, the combination of the mood, the mode, the major, therefore, the minor, with the values which are 16th notes or 8th notes, brings us to think that, like in an aria from uh, St. John or St. Matthew, Passion of his, again, in that case, it's, of course, program music in, in, in that case, because there is mourning and there is loss, uh, Christ is dying and uh, the Virgin Mary is crying. So how can we think of it happy, even if the music itself disconnected from its uh, intent in terms of the um, mood, uh, psyche, um, uh, program music basically. Um, here it's not, but at the same time, because there is no lyrics and there is no structural organization that brings us to think it's an aria or a recitativo, I could do, like in the beginning of an recitativo, and then... and make it more spoken, or I can make it more as an aria. it's obviously terrible. Why? Because I think it, it, it makes it, um, it belittles it. Even if he wrote in the Italian concerto a real aria with accompaniment. So the genre is the aria, so this is more of an aria. Even if it's a dialogue between two arias then. Or is it monologue of dialogues? of right hand only. And I can say, oh, why did you continue? That's his choice. And who am I to decide for him? Or then I should just play. And this repetitivity over the bars is not the repetitivity, it becomes a dialogue between the two parts. But thought provoking, we remember the first prelude, why is it not? He didn't choose to make it into a dialogue between two monologues in this case. He did. minor, the dominant. He does it fully in the left hand. And in some very rare cases together, like... Um, but most of the time the eighth notes are in one and the other one listens, or the other ones listen, since there are several. After you, after me, but you, but me, and you, and I, and together. Uh, which gives a sense of 
straight or when the eighth notes are speaking at the same time while in the opening and or most of the piece they're one after the other uh, even <laughs> of the articulation is it supposed to be all legato is the arpeggiation meant to be the same tempo as the eighth notes or the double and sixteenth notes or it's supposed to be unmeasured but then the third the fourth beat comes too late it becomes very organized but less lyrical to our taste or my taste to hear the octave leap. Which he responds by the seventh. Dominant seventh, obviously. To lock the again signature of C sharp minor since the prelude is there to determine the tonality. But he does so much more than just determine it. He gives us to um, imagine uh, genres arias or genres toccatas or genres um, recitativos but I think it's more hinted than su well suggested by the score itself so everything is said in the notes um, and everything that I say right now over the notes is high redundancy and most of the time probably vain because after all if you really want to think that today you should play something creative in it, why don't you write your own? Rather than uh, try to transform the one that he wrote. Again, beyond the authenticity uh, question, I would say that it's a question of um, aesthetics and morals. You know, we play what we were transmitted through the centuries it came to us today like this. Perhaps other people had different edition in generations before us. They weren't really aware of the differences that could have existed today. We have more musicologists who have developed a lot of knowledge about the different sources and all that of the uh, quest for authenticity, if not truth. It doesn't exist really as such only. But at the same time, there are conventions, there are organizations of group of bars. And all that said, it sounds more like um, describing how it is made rather than what it means in terms of, uh, at all levels, means to us spiritually, intellectually, or just digitally, or perhaps a combination of those. And so, Reducing the scales to scales is reductive because it's more than a scale. It's passing tones on the melody of the theme. as I did at all perhaps or little but uh, to emphasize the diminished seventh leap becoming an octave and the further the leap the more expression does it mean the delay compared to the major six ah mm. I don't know I mean I would think yes then I would play somebody will listen to it and say no that's overstating it it's already within the interval leap that he made already in his writing as I said earlier the notes themselves <laughs> he embedded the expression in the leap why do I have to overemphasize what it means to me or overemphasize what I think that difference of um, leap in that in this uh, choice of his makes and then could have been all only in sixths and still be 
very beautiful because not wrong, but perhaps less more banal. <laughs> big leaps that are very chromatic, very dramatic and very appoggiaturish, perhaps then it, it kills the, um, the effect that he creates by progressively stretching it into this painful leap of the octave in this, uh, in this sort of uh, mournful um, prelude, at least the mood that I think it is in or it, it emanates to me from it, <laughs> to be very honest and um, not assuming this general musician's op uh, opinion. It's probably just my, my reaction to it. But the fact is, is that if he had only those outrageously expressive intervals every beat, then perhaps Perhaps I'm not sure, but perhaps it it still creates the uh, the leaps, and you become used to them. So if you play exactly what he wrote, you appreciate it without to have to overstate it, which is difficult when you're very musical. I couldn't stop myself by nano delaying that leap to say, oh, but it's more than an octave even. It's a tenth, it's almost a desperate leap. And it's, at the, it's combined with a major, well, sorry, uh, well, top tetrachord in major of the minor ascending with a descending. Have this um, dissonant collision of the two minors, which enhances that sense of uh, pain, expression of uh, sorrow. But if I play it straight. find it um, more than distant. I find it uninvolved or borderline um, not caring. Now there are perhaps too much of a rubato if each of these leaps are expressed. <laughs> What could it be? major ending which is sort of like you never know why some of his endings of minor key works have this speaker the third and some don't or it could have also been minor and of course major but perhaps and for sure I think in those days the major minor had less the mood um, suggestion than the romantic era in the 19th century later would vehicle within the piece 
But perhaps not. Perhaps after all that was the purpose, not only for the beating of the harmonics, but also for the fact that he never finishes a major piece in minor provocatively, like um, the fifth prelude. <laughs> Again, he establishes one, two, four, one. But he doesn't do it. And he doesn't do it. And etc., etc. I'm not going to um, repeat myself because I already do very much as so most teachers do. Uh, but beyond that, if the D major finished. <laughs> He's never finished. It's silly to say, but it's a fact. He only would finish some of his minor key works in major. So is it mood or is it um, uh, harmonic beatings of the melodic uh, lines? I, mean, I don't know. <coughs> Besides, the point of the story is that I think if it's in major, there is no major ascending and major descending, like in uh, the modes of the minor. Harmonic, which is of course not a mod because it's based on the chordal harmonization, where it's harmonic. But in this, is not in the minor ascending or in the minor harmonic or in um, minor. is on the second sixteenth note to the next first, which is in fact the fourth, uh, if you count the second as first. Two three four one 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 and therefore always having the um, catapult almost like a launch of the pattern uh, after the bass note which is strictly on the beats. And then the group notes. And then with the downbeat note, which harmonizes with the bass, or suggests the harmonization, which the passing tones of the rest of the 16th notes ornament, or decorate, decorate, you would say, because ornament, well, Perhaps it's like Chacon and Pasakai, or Namen decorate something. Some people think it's the same. So when I start on the second sixteenth note, I give it a new pulse in the right hand, off of the pulse of the left hand. It's not. At least he didn't write it like that. It's two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. But one and two and three and four are on the beat and left. So if I re-articulate by separating the one from the two in the group of sixteenth notes, it gives me the dialogue of the rebounds. should slow down when he goes to relative minor in D minor, did he? But I did. And the fugue, certainly not vocal, it is um, flourished and um, uh, fast-paced tiratas of 30 seconds and then dotted rhythms. So you could say, as a performer today, oh, but even the fugues have moods or psychologically expressions of tension, release, or mood of, um, yeah. But I would still uh, remain more um, focused on the character of the preludes, which have a purpose, <coughs> 
which is harmonic, but they have a mood which is psychologically talking, talking to us either through the notation, either through the choice of the tonality. Look at the D minor. <laughs> is in triplets but always starting from the third half of the downbeat that kind of um, um, displacement very jazzy to our modern ears um, of this the kind of syncopation where the harmonization is not um, aligned but so how much do we have to bring that out and enhance it even more than just play the values of it it's not necessary to on top of it do create sort of a secondary melodic line from the uh, lo longer articulation of the departing third sixteenth 16th note again then it becomes a dialogue but perhaps it's more imaginary than real and of course if the acoustics are very resonant I mean, acoustically today we are in the hope that uh, we find something in the truth of the articulation rather than in the um, combined tr uh, uh, resonances of the acoustics truth, because then it becomes harmonized, or it's, or if not, it's arpeggiated. Not. But if you play in an acoustical room that's very resonant, or you put pedal. is in major, at least he chose to. And um, the next prelude, the E flat major, is uh, in two halves, one for the fingers, again dialogue one, four, five, one, nine, four, dominant five and seven, okay, and then uh, written out cadence of the 30 seconds, grouped also from the second to the next first from the eighth. That's played as a bundle. That's again his pedagogical way to notate the details that most composers before or during his time would have led to the fancy of literally fantasy of the performer. But anyway, this is uh, to teach the performer how to think of their own. And then there's a chorale uh, imitation style, almost as if it's a vocal view. But we're still in the prelude. So much to say that he had this opinion that prelude should be just harmonic displays of the tonality, way beyond their utility they become. played the prelude in the fugue within the prelude because it has so much of that
shows to us that he writes preludes as he likes, if they're character or if they're even fugal. Now this is a tricky one because he writes it in three two with half notes, which with a mournful feeling in the dotted rhythm would have sort of suggest to us some kind of an andante. suggest by the genre aria in this case that it's singing and if it's singing it might be fast but if it's in minor and mourning it might be slow therefore singing and slow is for legato then in the ninth one in E major <laughs> because that's how it sounds <laughs> but what if it was and I don't mean that provocatively only I try to make sense of it and say perhaps it can have the um, equal um, um, authenticity to our uh, performance even if it's not just a provocative opposition of what we think the primary mood of it is. After all, uh, it still could have been... But he associates this with some kind of more happy in major. And because it's in 12-8, the bowing of the most of his string pieces with 12-8 are always long and short, D or short long. They sound more interrupted on the piano than on the bow with the resonance of the string of the of the violin or the instrument. And they would sound mildly articulated on the piano and not too pointy. But um, then comes the articulation, but also the tempo. And if it's legato but allegro, I mean, the question here is integrity. Does it correspond to what? beyond what I've heard, beyond what I was taught, does it mean to me that it's... if I associate it to the Baroque bowing um, as a genre, or do I think of it as a piano piece that is all legato? Or do I like to put staccato, but then only the articulation while maintaining my direction of the line? for finding a combination that corresponds to your understanding, your hope of authenticity, combined with the mood that it brings you to translate to your audience or to your students. I think it's a combination of factors. It's not one thing alone between the notation, the suggestion, the what you hear it suggests. Um, I think one ends by finding some kind of answer to it. If not, it would be forever an open, uh, which it probably is most of the time, an open field of exploration without any final solution other than the temporary answers we give to it while we have it as a travel companion through life, after all. To teach it, to play it, to record it, to analyze it, to write about it, to notate it, to to even write it down from memory, to perform it on different instruments, authentic or not, 
it's different ways of living with it. It lives in you and you respond to it when you see the tenth one with the pattern. They say that Siloti, who was Rachmaninov's uncle, professor in uh, Russia, piano, who did this, uh, he calls it Bach Siloti, but in fact it's more Siloti than Bach. He took the second, well, the left hand of the E minor, printed number 10, and made it in D minor in the right hand with a chorale of his imagination that fits so well. More interpretation is literally paraphrase, and which is beautiful by itself. It's an homage, and it's a fact. But even if you know that this is what inspired it, he else played in most of his, of course. Then it becomes more of a mood piece in that case because it's about 19th century, 20 almost actually. Um, but regardless, um, no more the what we perceive today the old music was. And perhaps for Mozart, uh, Bach was different than for Chopin. Bach was different when he writes his sort of neo-baroque or classical sonata. Perhaps we all have a different view of the past of the music according to our present. Wrong or right, perhaps uh, we are more authentic than before, or perhaps less, or perhaps we choose to ignore it, or we choose to just play whatever it means to us, regardless how much we've learned what it's supposed to be according to the performance practice and the genres to which it's related, from which we assume that the number 11... <laughs> So in Hapsicourt suggests keep it in mind. Oops, sorry. <laughs> he he holds it in a in a suggestive way, but not in a real way. And so perhaps it's not important. Perhaps it's important just to hear the um, group of 16th notes by 3 times 2 or 2 times 3 or just 6 because if you collide the 6 over I mean the 2 times 3 over the 3 times 2 of the left hand it becomes then you overemphasize it in the articulation on the piano because then you hear something is not fitting but we saw that in his D minor. So sometimes he writes it more obviously, sometimes it's hinted in the design. What if he wanted really three times two against three times two? He would have written something like. Then it fits. And if it's ta 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 ta, you don't want to show it. So in a way, it's a characteristic um, sort of uh, rhythmic uh, dissonance that is playful uh, of the, in the dialogue between the two hands that you sort of minimize by not showing it too much or a little too much <laughs> to the eyes of the beholder because obviously it's too much to the ones, not enough to the others. So the others would say, play the notes, it will speak by itself because that's what the craftsmanship of his is so beautiful about, which is true, like in 12. Again, 16th notes, well, in the 
30 seconds. If it was in 30 seconds, how about the fabs played? Yeah, but it's in minor. And this time the F that was in the major, just in the fourth beat. Here is through. on the harpsichord but it's not important it you know it's there it's hinted so if not you have to do which is obviously ridiculous though in G minor he does it but it's his choice not mine at least on the piano we can hear it longer stay of course if I don't speak over it sorry for that stays around. Oh, I am afraid to annoy you with going through the whole 24 like that. I think I'll stop at 12 by saying perhaps redundancy and repetitivity is not only in the music but mostly in the teaching. I just wanted to share with you some of my thoughts, obviously, that are through life um, more or less informed, more or less intuitive, more or less um, uh, educated and more or less um, provocative um, in terms of what to bring out for what it means to me in order to make it a statement even if later or even next day I might try another way. Not that I have no um, respect for the text, let less uh, not one opinion about what genre it represents. It's more about the fact that I want to see if I can be um, convincing and therefore first convinced um, in different uh, aspects of its rendering. Um, not for the purpose of just proving or provoking, but if I find that it has um, its it reaches, in my understanding, its own truth at a different tempo that could be also a truth at a different tempo. I just accept it. I choose, but I don't deny unless I find that it's a character piece that is suggested, even if it's not mentioned, like in Chopin for the funeral march, and then I say, oh no, it's not supposed to be like that. Oh no, the style doesn't ask this. Oh, but the instrument this. Oh no, but the authenticity of the design that. Oh, but the expression of the time was meant to be this because of the aria, because of the bowing, because of the character of the other works he composed. So yes, you develop a, a, a background, a soundscape, a, a landscape of his music universe and then you realize that some of the factors um, that are constructive uh, for the different elements are foundable in other pieces. And you say, oh, he did it like this there, and he almost did it this way here. And the more you know of the different pieces, the more you take it relative rather than centrally essential uh, to the score that you have in front of you, even if you don't know any other piece of Bach and you just land on it. approach because that's the first essential approach is the psyche of course when we organize the thoughts of the group of bars the techniques of notation the, the, the very organization of the thought process and we start being very impressed about his melodic line his bass line his contrapoint in other words we start being impressed by his intellect more than by the mood that his music creates and then we try when we perform to sort of combine both and we're afraid, oh, it's going to be too romantic, meaning too much only the expression, or it will be too dry and too distant, or me only more the um, structure than the essence of the structure inside it. After all, the structure is a structure, but what you put inside colors it for the um, expression, therefore for the mood. Inevitably, major, minor plays some role, more or less, less or more. Um, it's difficult to always try to find the opposite to each thing when I try to give my own opinion because I want to remain open-minded and to be convinced by another point of view when it has its own coherence. And after all, who are we not to be 
searching for that coherence even if we trip on the way as students, but as performers, as teachers even, as recording people. I think um, at different points of our life we are touched by different aspects of it. Probably that's what the beauty about it, it's like a book that you reread that you loved when you were young and that you see in it other things that don't cancel what you already liked or perhaps sheds a different light and all of a sudden you hear this piece played by somebody and you go, I thought that was only but look what it could be. Or, uh, no, it shouldn't be that, this couldn't be, this is wrong. Of course, we're prone to um, criticize what we don't know, hear, or heard, because we think that we establish some kind of totem around it, and that's what we want to translate and transmit through playing or teaching, recording, um, or in this case, um, talking about it. But it helps to um, liberate one's fears of, am I right or wrong to try this? Am I right or wrong to play it in that tempo? Am I right or wrong to use the pedal? Am I right or wrong this or right or wrong that? I think there is no right or wrong. There is only a perception of, a, of a truth that you think you're reaching at some point that you think means what the piece was supposed to mean. But it's an assumption, and I don't even think that at the end we are really only interested by the authenticity as much as by the authenticity of what it means to us, rather than only the authenticity of what it meant to him when he composed it, or to the students whom he taught it with. Of course, we'll never know since he'll never come back, but he's with us daily, perhaps even by giving us the opportunity to even think differently of his music than he thought of it. But by guiding the young students, I still have to open their minds or allow them not to close their minds by only funneling them through an addition's truth. After all, it takes time to understand relativity in truth or tolerance rather than forbidden and uh, allowed. But uh, ultimately, I think they will create their own sense of the students becoming their own selves, they don't need to only study, they, well they study by themselves, we all study constantly, but when we transmit the knowledge there is some kind of level of assertion, this is supposed to be this way, and then the students say mm-hmm, then they go home and do it differently, and that's fine. I think it's fine, because it proves that it becomes theirs. So it's not vain to try different ways, even opposite ways of what you're told or you taught or you heard. I find it a fascinating world of, if not recomposition, reappropriation. Some call it interpretation because it's like, like translation. Perhaps the translation is already the instrument's choice, but beyond, it's in the fact that we are translating it within our own psyche, more or less within our own time. Thank you.